is a little bit different than what we uh, encounter here in upstate New York. And aspirations are relevant not only to cities in Western Australia, but to those globally. The data, especially that of challenges to Perth development, climate change, and limited water resources, the description of Perth culture, the mapping of opportunities and constraints for city growth, and the provocative scenarios that follow build the argument, both rhetorically and literally, for alternative ways to handle growing populations in challenged regions. In this effort, Weller builds on the important contributions he's made to the field of landscape urbanism. In particular, his essay, An Art of Instrumentality, Thinking Through Landscape Urbanism, in Waldheim's Landscape Urbanism Reader, works toward collapsing the divide between planning and design, and perhaps more importantly, between instrumentality and art, and advances landscape architecture as the discipline through which to project urban futures. In addition to Professor Weller's extraordinary contribution to our field in the form of writing, he is a designer and brilliantly crosses the divide between theory and practice. He has received numerous international design competition awards at all scales of landscape architecture and urban design. His earlier work is cataloged in room 413, Innovations in Landscape Architecture, convincingly shows how landscape drives the formation of the city. His participation in over 12 significant major design projects in Australia, North America, Asia, and Europe suggests the span of his design influence. On a personal note, I've had the pleasure of meeting Richard uh, on only one occasion, last spring in Korea, uh, as co-jurors for the Yongsan International Park Competition. This experience of working closely and intensely together for three days only underscored my high opinion of him, because sometimes that doesn't happen after four days of work like that. So please join me in welcoming Richard Weller to Syracuse, to this lecture, to the Movement on Main competition jury that will happen tomorrow, and to the United States. I'm just trying to get turned on. Is that on? Is that on? Pressing the button. Okay, is that on? Is that on? Yeah. That's on. Okay. Um, thank you, Julia. I, <laughs> Korea. Last time I saw Julia was very, very late that last night of the competition, and then we had to get to the airport in the morning, right? And it was one of those nights where you, I didn't even have enough sleep for the for the hangover to set in. It was just. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a hard job. It was hard. Competitions are hard. I, I, in some ways, I feel like I should have prepared a lecture that is specific to this place. It's always good when you can have a, a lecture, a visit that does something that's really relevant to where you are and the issues you're thinking about. I haven't done that, I'm sorry. Um, but I've got a whole cluster of big themes that I do want to take this opportunity to work. Um, I don't think the lecture is particularly well organised. I've been quite busy down at Penn and I've grabbed a few things, but I am going to try and work a few themes. Wildlife. Um, <laughs> and the, none of the themes are light. So I know you're tired, it's the end of the day, you've come out of the studio and so on, but I don't do light. And um, so, but I'll, I'll try and um, work these themes in a a fairly nimble way. We'll cover a lot of territory and do it um, acrobatically, let's say. The lecture is called Global Landscape Futures, and if it isn't, you better tell me now, because that's what I thought it was. <laughs> I, that, that gives me enough room to move. Um, I am going to speak about a global scale of operation. I will speak about landscape-based interests, and uh, most of my research is concerned with modelling variations on the future, on modelling alternative futures. I have found that the future is a very nice place to work. Um, it's a question of when you're working with the future, the, the future is full of charlatans and dangerous utopias and all sorts of hallucinations. Um, so, but it gives you, that there's scope for the imagination. But I've been trying to do, I've been trying to work on alternative futures in a way that is 
rational. And not futures that are so far out in time that they get wobbly. You know, they're underpinned with research and data and also, also not futures that are so close to where we are now that they're short-sighted. There's a sort of a time frame. And if you look at what's going on around the world, a lot of people are pegging their, their research toward a mid-21st century point in time. And I'm, so I'm kind of interested in that, um, but I'm also the last book, which I'll show you a little bit of, I've pushed out to 2,100. You know, you start going out that far, things can get a little bit wobbly. And, um, but I work, at the moment, I'm working generally where I can find reliable statistics, I will work to the point that those statistics go. So if I can find good data for 2,100 that I think is relatively reliable, then I'll, 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 I can work with that. Um, a quick, let me put this first image up. Uh, this, I think I first saw this in the New York Times a few years ago. It's not original, but we've made our own version of it. A world as a city, a global city, a planet completely colonised and devoured by the city. Of course, when we complete building the world city, it won't look like that. Um, but as an allegory of urbanisation, it's kind of fitting. And the halo that I've put around it is, of course, the um, an atmosphere that is becoming increasingly saturated with carbon. So carbon is now at 392 parts per million and rising, and it will continue to rise for most of the 20th century, whether you like it or not, as we lift vari as various cultures lift themselves out of poverty. We've had our industrial revolution. Um, we're trying to unpack the problems of modernity now. We're trying to repair systems and repair the damage that's been done by the over-exploitation of modernity. Other cultures around the world, um, not least of all China, are now going through their rapid urbanisation and their rapid industrial um, revolution. And of course they have a right to do that. Uh, and we've been broadcasting images of the desired for so long now that it would be improper for us to sort of grandstand that India, China, South America, various other places can't aspire to the material wealth that we do. Now the interesting thing about the process of rapid urbanisation, just if we, if we think of a, I'll give you a snapshot of the entire history of urbanisation. Before there were cities, for the nomad, the planet was a garden. There was no, land, no understanding of landscape. It was just, I think, psychologically for the nomad, it would have been, the world would have been a garden. It's, it's known territory, mapped with language and song and, and spiritual emblems and so on. The agricultural revolution and the creation of the first cities effectively put an end to that nomadic understanding and mapping of large-scale landscape systems whereby for time immemorial culture had been relatively sustainable in operation, in synchrony with the biorhythms of the planet and plants and animals and so on. The construction of cities sets people aside and literally builds a a semiotic wall between the culture that is inside the early city and then the landscape or nature which can be constructed as beyond and threatening in some way. Nature becomes threatening and other because you lose the knowledge that you once had which would have been nomadic. So settlement was a very, in many ways settlement was a stupid idea, severing our ties with an intimacy with larger natural systems. Settlement um, had many virtues, of course, and, and rapidly incubated people. So cities became, it also incubated disease and, and the arts. But if you think of the 10,000 year history of cities, you can, you can match that to population growth. So population has been rapidly growing through the agency of urbanisation. What is now, I think, of most interest, however, is that Demographers are telling us that by the end of the 20th century, 21st century, sometime around the end of the 21st century, global population will stabilise. So that 10,000 year project of incubating humans through the agency of urbanisation will come to a, an end point. Now we won't see that exactly in our lives, right? Um, but 
it's very interesting to be on the absolute tail end of, of that large-scale trajectory that I've just described, where you've got a runaway species that exploits its environment through its primary technology of urbanisation, and then that, pro, that, that project, if you can call it that, will, will come to, a, to an end point. Now, why is that? It's because, um, paradoxically, cities actually put a dampener on population growth. So you have, um, run, you have runaway population growth around the planet now still, but primarily in poor agrarian situations. As people move into cities and experience congestion and competition and particularly have access to education and healthcare and so on, uh, you ultimately get a dampening of population. So if I can be so bold as to say this, I think what we're looking at is end of the 20th century, a relatively stable population of 10 billion people. That's what we're being told. It'll be another 100 years or, or more of, or so of growth that will stabilise. And then you have a situation where we will have constructed a world city and all of its attendant ancillary infrastructure. And the question then becomes, OK, can 10 billion people live a dignified life with one planet, with the resources that are available to us? Now, clearly, with our current technologies, the answer is no, they cannot. It's the, it, we know it's completely un unsustainable. You need three, four, five planets. If, everyone, if every one of those 10 billion people lives like an American does now, or an Australian or, or European, so-called first world. So the, really, this is a design problem, um, as well as an ethical problem, and, and so on and so forth. But as fossil fuels fade, as water becomes harder to access, as we lose more, more and more topsoil, and yet we're going to have to nourish people who will be aspiring to a better material life and multiply that by up to 10 billion people, it's a design problem. It's a hell of a design problem. Everything will have to be redesigned. Um, and that's, you know, um, I'm optimistic about that. Without being glib, I am optimistic about that. Human beings are rat cunning. They've survived you know, they've survived incredible climatic changes. Um, but the question is whether, whether um, through the application of technology, we can reach what would be a truly sustainable or relative equilibrium between such a large number of people who consume so many resources within such a limited environment. So that's the challenge that, 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 that the, um, the world city essentially faces. And I'm interested in that because landscape architecture, since Ian McCarg in the middle of the 20th century, or in fact even going back before that, landscape architects are always involved in, that, in those larger narratives and larger challenges. I mean, it, it, working at that scale developed a bad, uh, a bad name because it became referred to as planning. And I'll probably talk about that a little bit as we go on. But I, I think now we can, we can do away with a a sort of a, a polarised and problematic um, separation of design as a sort of a high art, highly ling linguist linguistic operation on the one hand and then planning which is sort of dull and instrumental and methodological on the other. Landscape architecture now has the potential to combine these, the agency of planning with the art of design and provide design intelligence for some of those very big issues that I've just muddled my way through, right? Um, so that's, that's what I see as the sort of greater purpose, as it were, of design intelligence this century. Um, speaking of Ian McCarg, who was a, one, my predecessor as a chair at Penn, and a very well-known chair because he converted the school into a, essentially a planning operation and stacked the faculty with environmental scientists. He also... Um, when I was a student, I hated the guy, to be frank with you, because we were told, um, we were instructed in terms of the method that he had developed, which is a fairly simple thing now that we all take for granted with GIS and so on, of layering up maps to reach a rational decision about where you should build and where you shouldn't build and where you should do, what are the most appropriate land uses for a particular, a given area of land. It was methodologically simplistic, it reduced the, it overly 
uh, reduced the world and it became bound up with a sort of um, almost a self, not like self-righteous is probably too strong a word, but a sense that it was absolutely correct and therefore you don't need design. You, all of the latitude that we associate with creative intelligence and the creative process in and of itself was marginalised from this operation. So I was not fond of that because I had a natural tendency toward lateral thinking and I was interested in ideas and I knew very early on that knowledge is always contingent and, and imperfect and messy. Um, and I also didn't like the fact that the instructors at the time, that we had a computer in the university and compu the computer then occupied a whole room. There was one computer and you got card, punch cards, which you had to go and shove into this machine uh, to start to produce the data which would give you green blobs on plans and the right answer if you just did the, followed the method properly. Anyway, uh, McCarg also is famous for his uh, polemic and one of the most famous quips from McCarg is that landscape architects are stewards of the earth, which I've written large on this slide and this is a drawing from McCarg. And paradoxically, you'll see drawings from me towards the end of this lecture which look a bit like this drawing, a kind of heroic master planning view of things, which for the last, quite rightly, for the last few decades, we've been unpacking and deconstructing and critiquing. But I'm finding that that view of the world, again, is quite useful. We'll come back to... Rep I'll touch on representation as we go through some of the images. Anyway, to the expression, stewards of the earth... This, this is, for landscape architects, this is a kind of Faustian bargain. Landscape architects suffer from an inferiority complex because on the one hand, in the real world, when they're doing jobs, they're often reduced to decorators, right? On the other hand, there's this voice in their head going, no, you're a steward of the earth. The whole earth. And yet I'm arranging flowers on a, on a road somewhere as a job. And so the trivialisation of what should have been the majesty of stewardship and this, this divine calling... Somewhere between those two extremes, landscape architects make sense of their lives. And um, there are bits throughout this lecture that I hope will chart that territory. Um, McCarg also referred... This is Staten Island, incidentally, before... Uh, and I'll come back to Staten Island again in another image somewhere in the lecture. I think it's buried in there. McCarg referred to the city as God's junkyard. Right? So this was... You know, the city was the problem. Whereas I guess what I was tending to suggest with the very first image was that the city is the solution. I mean, there's no other way around it. Urban infrastructure has colonised every square metre of the planet to some, in, in some way. Now, we have to unpick that and adjust it and integrate the world city with the ecosystems of the planet, for sure. That's the creative work that will be our primary task. And McCard would have agreed with that. He knew that. <laughs> It's just that the way he organised it in his mind was relatively simplistic insofar as the city was a problem which is over here and nature and landscape which is redemptive or paradise lost is over there. And if you can keep the two separate with a, with a clear line so you delineate the world in that manner then the systems can both function uh, more effectively. So that kind of simplicity is no longer possible. I mean you fly over in North America and look down you see a completely integrated system. You can't tell where nature and culture starts and stops. It's, it's useless to even think that way. Um, so, uh, this also sets up landscape as only ever being able to play Paradise Lost, which is another hopeless dream. You know, it's, it, it's to try and recreate the prelapsarian is, in and of itself, a problem. It's an aesthetic problem. It's an aesthetic impossibility. It's a moral impossibility. It's, 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 and yet I am interested in paradise. I've always been interested in it, uh, and, and I, I, I think it remains deeply embedded at the root of landscape architectural thinking, for better or for worse. And it just, like all allegorical material, it depends how you use it. It depends how well you understand it and how you appropriate it or malappropriate it. <coughs> If you, if you read Genesis, you find two narratives at work. One is the narrative of stewardship, as environmentalists now like to refer to it, where we were instructed 
to dress and keep it, that is the earth, to dress or the garden, earth as garden, earth before cities, earth before settlement. That's the, the anthropological version of the narrative of the Garden of Eden is, is simply the factual transition from nomadicism to settlement. Paradise becomes a figure in our mind which explains to us the loss of our intimacy with natural systems. And we make mementos of the natural landscape called gardens then, inside the walled enclave of the city as a memento mori of what we've lost, which is that... that um... So, the narrative of stewardship is, is one way of reading Genesis um, which would align with the McCargian view and the landscape architectural view of now correlating cultural systems to natural systems. The other view is, of course, the one that we're more familiar with, which is the narrative of dominion whereby we are encouraged to populate, replenish, manipulate, subdue, more aggressive language about how we treat our environment. And the wellspring of... I mean, if, if, if this narrative lies at the root of Judeo-Christianity and Islam, as it does, the three great monotheistic religions of the world, the religions of the city, the religions of the book, of writing... Um, then, you know, it's, it's, we have to inquire into it in terms of its efficacy now. It's quite useful in terms of our moral relationships. We still draw on this in terms of our legal structure, the way we organise our societies, but it hasn't been so effective in terms of our environmental relationships. It hasn't helped instruct us as to, or given us a code by which we can relate to plants and animals and what we more broadly refer to as the ecosystem. And, I mean, the attempt to green Christianity now is quite interesting. To argue that the earth is the body of Christ is a, an interesting manoeuvre. But, you know, down on Main Street it comes across as sophistry, right? Um, anyway, I, I, I kind of prefer the reality of, of this quote, which is taken from Donna Haraway. She said, the cyborg was not born in a garden. In other words... Um, the, what, the cyborg, of course, you're all familiar with um, being a, a spliced combination of machine and organism, which is effectively the entire planet now. If you think of the planet as an evolving entity, it's evolved into a machined phase, a cyborgian phase. And Haraway says the cyborg wasn't born in a garden. I mean, it's born in a laboratory. It's born of culture. It's born of power relations. It's born of politics and so on. Um, and, and if that's true, then we have no need for paradise. The paradisical can quietly exit the room. So then how do we construct an ethical foundation upon which we deal with these big issues in the 21st century in terms of our critical relationships with natural systems? Even to say natural systems is wrong. I'm, I'm just borrowing that, that, that word so that you know what I'm referring to. I like this image. That's uh, a graphic of all the space junk flying around the planet, all the shit we just throw out into space. You don't think of it quite like that, but it's a radically denatured planet, and then we can put the new CO2 atmosphere in that we've created and are actively creating to drive the planet into a new phase whereby if we go beyond that tipping point, they're telling us it will then become an irreversible uh, period of increasing heat, which is going to be very interesting, to say the least. Let me now turn to another big thinker. I've, I've, I've introduced you to McCarg and made a few comments about him. I'd like to now turn to James Lovelock, who wrote The Gale Hypothesis, I think, in 1979. He asked William Golding for the name of this book, and, and Golding said, call it, or use Gaia, the Greek goddess of the earth. I think that personally, if I was a, if I can be so bold as to criticise this work, I think that was a mistake. I think to feminise the earth is unnecessary, um, and it's probably plagued the whole idea of a uh, this particular reading of the planet uh, since. But it's very interesting. Gaia is good to think with, right? It's very, very interesting, because it's the the move that Lovelock makes is that we are subservient to the planet. The planet is the new deity. It's not God as removed from the earth and the earth as fallen. He puts 
divinity through the agency of a Greek goddess into the earth. The earth is the meta-organism and we are but a component of that organism. Which then, um, uh, you know, from there you can, you can derive a sort of set of modern, perhaps moral and ethical codings vis-a-vis -vis how we should conduct ourselves within the body of a larger ecosystem. It could help us in that regard. It's certainly an interesting um, shift in terms of your, the, you know, the, the beauty and the dignity of the human being to be, it, it's historically unprecedented that we would think of ourselves, except the Greeks did think a little bit like that, of ourselves as simply part of a larger meta-organism, which is alive. And, you know, um, Lovelock gives that organism um, sentience, you know, he almost gives it consciousness and speaks about it in a very anthropomorphic way. He refers to the planet as she, or it, and it wants, it does, it is doing, it's, it's thinking. Um, and so the quote at the top, her unconscious goal, he gives the planet agency and purpose and teleology. Her unconscious goal is a planet fit for life. So all she wants, if we can just play this out for a minute, all she wants is to maximise life, okay, as, as, as a being in a larger, you know, the void of, of the cosmos. If humans stand in the way of this, we shall be eliminated. So there's a kind of fire and brimstone eviction from paradise at work here. It's the old apocalyptic moral stuff, but it's cast in an ecological way. So that's quite, that's quite interesting. That, so then you ask, well, okay, why did the Earth, if the Earth is sentient, and I don't believe it is, it doesn't know what it's doing with foresight. Evolution is just this messy time developmental thing. But if, because if, if she was sentient, why did she create a species as dangerous as us, which is a runaway in terms of its population growth? And you could say, well, yeah, okay, if she was sentient, she wouldn't do that. That's kind of stupid because we're probably going to take everything else down with us, right, in terms of slow cooking the planet. But on the other hand, Gaia is operating over such large time frames. I mean, for two billion years, cyanobacteria covered the entire planet, did nothing. Nothing happened. They're just little single cells rolling around on their backs, looking at stars and absorbing and giving out oxygen, which was toxic to them, so they killed themselves. They had a really good time for two billion years until they, they killed themselves off, they, which is kind of like what we're doing, but in a shorter time frame. So perhaps these are all part of, I don't know, evolutionary steps. This is interesting too, because if we follow, that's the internet, right? Uh, if we follow Lovelock's logic, then we have been beavering away with our technological advances. This is what Lovelock, how Love, Lovelock would position us as agents of um, um, not, not Gaia's plan, but, but we've been, if we, if we do appreciate that we are in some way subservient to a meta-organism, then we've just, we think we've created the internet. We're fantastic. Lovelock would see that as a, a species or, or part of the planet's evolution. It has simply evolved intelligence. Gaia has evolved mind through the agency of human beings. Um, and, it, you know, from there you can, you can wander with your thoughts about what that means. You know, Lovelock even talks about the fact that the first shots of the Earth in 1969 is a kind of moment of vanity or self-reflection for the planet. Perhaps that's going too far. He talks about three Cs, which are the problems. Chainsaws, cars and cattle. Um, things we love, right? Chainsaws not so much, but cars and cattle are good. Um, this is Kalimantan in Borneo. I don't know if any of you have been there. It's an absolute tragedy the way that they are burning that place. Um, this is where you still find a, a small population of orang uh, uh, orangutans. Anyway, um, this is, you know, Lovelock refers to this as literally taking the skin off the body. And therefore the organism can't self-regulate anymore the way it always has with vegetation. It needs the vegetation to self-regulate, to manage the planet, which then, at a certain, in a certain bandwidth of temperature, which begets life. Um, 
Gale will soon dispatch many of us through drought, sea level rise, etc. Only a few oases will exist where there is enough water, where there will be enough water to grow enough food. So he, here's the apocalyptic scenario of human beings being reduced through climate change down to a few very fertile patches or clefts in the body of the earth, where perhaps from there we will repopulate and, and evolution will continue. That's the sort of dramatic. Um, that is the antithesis of what I described at the beginning, which is a planet with 10 billion human beings living in well-organised, well-designed cities that are metabolically tuned to ecosystems. There, there's the sort of two different um, aspects of, of the future. I don't think, from an environmental point of view, the demise of humanity is a, a big problem. I don't think it's a problem to the planet necessarily. The only agency that we can have from Gaia's perspective that's of any use to her is that we can deflect asteroids if and when necessary, right? That's about all. Um, what is really, I think, a, a horrifying uh, prospect is that if we do cook the planet the way we are, then we'll take everything out with us and reduce the genetic stock to such a level that it will be impossible for the planet to regenerate. See, life on Earth always gets knocked back um, in terms of climate change and so on. It goes through these, this is episodic, it, all, it always happens in a sense, the climate is always changing. But it can always reconstruct itself in more interesting and creative ways. There have been 30 billion species created on this planet. It's an incredibly creative thing. And we don't know the value of that. We don't know what that means. We don't know the real value of that creativity in a larger cosmological scheme of things. And yet we're prepared to wantonly destroy it. So uh, uh, here in the red it says perhaps the ultimate crime, however, is that um, as the Earth gets hotter it won't be able to support virtually any life. It'll go into a phase of irreversible heat which takes it, as, he, as Lovelock says at the bottom, the Earth will become like Venus Gaia's dead sibling. Um, and from that point, you'd have to say, on a cosmological time scale, there would be no return. If you wish to take responsibility for that, I mean, I, don't, I just don't think that's a burden that any of us can take, you know, if you really think about that. So what do we do? Well, we get back to engineering and we try to fix things up and... This is Lovelock's list of things we could do. We can inject sulfuric acid into the atmosphere. We're talking now about reducing the, the inevitable uh, increase in temperature, uh, construct a fine carbon fibre mesh. Incidentally, in, injecting sulfuric acid, that means we'd be blowing sulfuric acid out, out of the arse of all of our aeroplanes as we fly around the world to try and thicken up the atmosphere to deflect, more, to, to deflect heat. Build a fine carbon fibre mesh, generate low-flying clouds, put scrubbers on all our production points, plant trees. Interestingly, he says it's not just a point of... Uh, you, it's not just about planting trees. You need to construct ecosystems. That, that's quite interesting. It's not just a plantation. It's not a mechanistic thing of rolling out more trees to do the work of absorbing carbon. The planet's ecosystems need to be healthy for the planet to continue to beget life. Farm the surface of the oceans... Um, and make waste from agricultural uh, produce, waste into char, right? So there's various things we can do about climate change. They're all projects, I suppose, from a designer's perspective. They're all kind of interesting projects. Um, or, of course, he says, just get the planet to do it for us. The planet's systems are designed to absorb carbon. She absorbs 550 gigatons per year. So it works perfectly well. It's just that we're pushing it over a tipping point at the moment. Um, so, which brings us back to Ian McCarg, who I've, I've put here on top of a packet of cigarettes because he loved smoking Marlboro cigarettes. Right? And with the quote on the top is from Lovelock again, it says, it takes a lot of hubris to even think of ourselves as stewards of the earth. In practice, few of us can even take care of our own bodies. In other words, it's a horror story that we would be stewards of the earth because we have to then manage everything. We can't even organise traffic flow in a small town, right? We, we you know... And here we are saying, well, we'll organise the ecosystems and take responsibility for the ecosystems of the planet as a design project. It seems to me we have no choice. We now do have to re-engineer systems so that the global city can sustain itself through the, uh, through, um, the ecology upon which it depends. That's incredibly complex work. Um, take something relatively simple like a river and imagine the amount of intelligence you need to 
to design from its source to a, down to a delta, all of those landscape types and all of the different infrastructures and so on involved in just one catchment is almost unthinkably complex. And yet that's what we have to do now. We've built ourselves into that position. Um, Lovelock then, you know, he kind of says humanity could be wiped out and then the planet, he says it would only take about 100 years if we weren't here for the planet to be, um, to regenerate itself with, through, through vegetation primarily. Um, and it would be all right. It might be able to temper what we've unleashed in terms of the um, irreversible heating of the planet. But, but then he does, he does make a turn which is closer to the operations of planning and design, but he uses a medical analogy and he says we need a general practitioner of planetary medicine, which is also often invoked in landscape architectural discourse, that landscape architects should be able to perform on the body of the earth the way a, a specialist or a, or a doctor performs on your body. Now, I don't know, you know, that's an interesting thing to think through. And I've, I've blipped in here the image of Franken, Dr. Frankenstein, of course, and the monster, because the, the, the monster is such a perfect um, allegorical figure for the world that we've created. And, you know, the, the, the Mary Shelley's narrative here, the brilliance of it, was that she foresaw the problem of a, an enlightened scientific modernity, which tried to um, manipulate life, with, particularly with electricity, the, 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 you know, the absolute, the quintessence of modernity is electricity, right, 20th century modernity at least, driven into this cyborgian creature to try and make it come to life, and all we can create is monsters. So the world we build, the nature we make, is monstrous. And then, of course, the, 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 the good Dr. Frankenstein, he can't bear it. He can't look, he can't accept that he's created this monster. So he, um, he takes no responsibility for it. And therein lies the moral the parable, I suppose, with our times, that we need to take responsibility for our monsters, right? We need to take responsibility for the monstrous landscape we've created. This is a more up-to-date version from an Australian artist that I rather like, Patricia Piccinini. It's the same, she's also working on a similar theme, except here she's taken, on, obviously the model plays on all the stereotypes of physical, you know, she's an attractive woman and she could be, you know, working in advertising and so on and so forth. So beauty as we know it in a commercial sense is kind of encapsulated with her. And yet then your, your eye works to the other side of the image and you're trying to deal with something which is aberrant and monstrous. The um, famous Vacanti mouse, which has... It's not genetic, so it's actually not that interesting. It's just an implant. But it was visually certainly spectacular enough to create a scandal. And it's just the scandal of the denatured. It's just as scandalous as every square metre of the earth that we've remade for ourselves in some way or other where we've spliced things together. And so there's a, it's a very interesting image because it starts to render um, the, the, the space between that which we find um, you know, unattractive and that which we find beautiful is, is complicated, to say the least, in this sort of work. <coughs> it's a nice emblem for the actual landscape. In this case, there's a, a drawing from a surgeon on flesh before the operation, and I've put over that a quote from James Corner, uh, previous chair at Penn. And Jim says, creativity in landscape architecture has all too frequently been reduced to dimensions of environmental problem solving and aesthetic appearance. In other words, the doctor here is either going to do something superficial, like cosmetic surgery, or in a, in a fairly instrumental medical way, is going to cut the body open, go in, remove something which is problematic or do a very specific operation without, as it were, dealing with the whole patient. It's not a cultural project. It's a strictly medicinal intervention, whether it's on the surface or whether it's interior. Either way. And I think that kind of does relate to uh, a critique of late 20th century landscape architecture where on the one hand it was very instrumental with Ian McCargan planning methodology or on the other hand cosmetic and superficial. Um, I think we're moving back into a superficial phase, actually, just because of... I might come to that. I hope I've got an image to prompt that because 
the sort of Photoshop Arcadia that's been unleashed in the last few years is just, I thought we'd killed it off, but it's back with a vengeance. I mean, nature is good for business. Every development on Earth now needs landscape to soften all its edges. It's the Vaseline on the lens, yet again. And here's Jim drawing on the Earth now, right? Not on a body. And I like this because here he says, how might landscape architectural crea creativity informed through its representational <laughs> traditions enrich and inform the ecological idea of the, in the imagination and material practices of a people? What Corner is saying here is that the, the, pro the design project, the design intelligence of landscape architecture is more than just instrumental. It is a cultural project. It has to work with genes, genetic material and memes. That is also the site that I showed you in the first image where McCarga had the quote, you know, and I said, um, uh, the, the city is God's junkyard. That was Staten Island. And so here is a landscape architectural project that um, is dealing with that scene. So in the symbolic order of things, this is an important project. I thought this was an important project. I thought this was a serious project um, of trying to develop effect, you know, to, be, to, be, to develop means by which you could fix that that um, incredibly polluted site up, led to certain uses of data and time developmental methodologies and the application of ecology in a fairly rigorous way, but nonetheless it was still a designed piece of work. It still has an aesthetic agenda, although the aesthetic was buried fairly deep in the uh, process that was to unfold catalytically through the design. So that, I think that project had rigour. And I, I, th here, the images, these are the early days before the Photoshop you know, the, uh, before we got balloons and super fit people taking photographs inside photoshopped images and windmills and solar panels. There are windmills here, but these are the early days of the genre, so we can excuse them. Um, there's no birds, at least, or at least they're sort of sitting in the water where they probably, you know, there's no balloons. And I like the landscape. It looks injured, right? It's damaged. It's, it's, this is a slow, serious process of healing the skin of that particular place. So I thought there was a sparsity about this. A Spartan, an economy of means, you could say. This is no, there's no, the designers here aren't offering you a sort of bullshit paradise. But that won't stop landscape architects. No, 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 they are. They are, they are at it. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know how you can turn up the dials any greener in Photoshop, but if, if, if you could, they would. This aiding and abetting of the global city and its, all its, you know, monstrous forms is, as I said, nature is good for business. Um, and we just wander off into this sort of bucolic, meaningless sunset, I suppose. You strip the Photoshop away and there's no design left. It's just rubbish. Meanwhile, the city continues and the city is violent, right? The city is violent. It's, it's not a light, fast, sexy thing the way we like to portray it or theorise it. It's heavy. It's full of gravity, full of, you know, lime and, and concrete and it, it, it's incredibly voracious and destructive. The Australian and North American conditions is more like this, of course. And while landscape architects in North America have been very good on brownfield sites, I think perhaps a little bit too preoccupied with brownfield sites, but that reflects a certain moment culturally and economically, sprawl is continuing. I mean, America, even though it mightn't feel like it, particularly in this part of America, but it's still a growth economy. I mean, you've still got an immigration rate. You're still building houses. There'll be another 100 million people here in the next century. So where are they going to live? Are landscape architects speaking to that problem? The landscape urbanism, the um, reader, wasn't it, which, which Julia referred to, was an effective moment. It was an empowering moment for landscape architecture. People don't use the term so much now. I think it's a little bit disingenuous to just walk away from it. A lot of us invested in the term for a decade and thought about it, and it was empowering because it, was, it did reproach the city, not as God's junkyard, but as a metabolic system that we need to work with. So it's a, it's a major shift in terms of the discipline. Um, I, 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 for me personally, I found it quite useful. It came at the right time for me to think about what I was doing as a practitioner and in terms of theory and move away from an interest in semiotics and get back to um, some real world work, right? 
and and that so I found that quite productive, which I can skip you through very briefly now. Um, I've, I've put three projects up on the on the screen here. The first is a suburb for 40,000 people, where we deployed a fairly strict landscape system based on stormwater and avenues of trees and ecological systems. And I'll we won't go into, into that in detail. The next project, which is indicated by the book cover there, is a city for 4.2 million. Is scenario planning for the city of Perth where I was living and working, which Julia also referred to. But that was interesting polemically because it. I took on the planning system and I took on a whole city and tried to apply design intelligence at that scale and open up the future of that city to various options and engage with the public. You know, that was real town hall meeting stuff every day for, 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 for a long period of time. The last book, which has just come out now, I'm not selling books, I hate that, I'm not interested, but I've got to show you a picture of what I'm doing, right? Um, the last book is, is, a, is has, has dealt with the whole national condition of Australia because we are quite different to where you are here. We have a boom economy and it just won't stop because our, our economy is fueled by resources being shipped to China. We just dig stuff up and they send the cash down, you know, and we just keep building houses. And, and to, to fuel that, to keep the engine burning, we have a high immigration rate. We keep our country young through immigration and the population is, you know, doubling before our eyes. So we're looking at a total population in Australia. It's 22 million now. It'll be 62 million by the end of the century. So I've taken that on as an issue and tried to work with it and work at that scale. So there's a scale increase across the three images you see here, from suburban, large-scale work in and of itself, to a whole city in Boomtown and then a whole country. And I will end up this lecture by showing you, indicating something about the whole world. Um, if you'll excuse what seems like megalomania, it's just a gradation of scale. Uh, that's the suburban project, but let's not dwell on that. That, that suburban project, the 40,000 people can live in those grey tones that you see there. The striations are the stormwater system and avenues of trees that forms a public open space matrix. It was quite a nifty idea of, of controlling the otherwise chaotic market of suburbia, right? It's a, it's a hard area to work in. But, oh, see that? The, the gooey stuff running through the centre is habitat and riparian zone that we've set back off and would then invest in and repair to a degree. But the reason I'm mentioning that is because those, those uh, sinuous bits that run through the master plan connect then to a larger study, which is the whole of city. You can see the project is now that little yellow blob. And that's the, the drawing there is of the whole city scale. This landscape structure plan we did was to develop a network of habitat corridors at a whole of city scale so that the biodiversity of this region could move and, and we could connect all of this remnant public open space. That's a very important point, that, and on a global scale too. It, as climate change increases, the gene pool needs to move. It's no good locking nature up in national parks that are isolated. It's, it, it, we need connectivity on a whole of nation and uh, scale if you want biodiversity to be able to adapt over time to the changing climate. So. Um, I think could then argue to the developers, um, you know, you can, you, can, you can go to work in the white areas. Don't touch the green stuff. This is very McCargian, but that's, Im that's also important. Sometimes you do need to know where to go and where not to go. This hybridised, the interest in, in, in theorising and doing projects which insist on a literal weaving together of natural and cultural systems is sometimes mistaken insofar as it can damage ecosystems that need space and time to do their thing. Um, the, the way we then approached the whole city was not to do a master plan, like oh, here's, here's our better design, just believe in us. We didn't do that at all. We ran scenarios, eight, nine, ten scenarios I think it was in the end, for how the city could grow over time and which incites public discourse and also help the city vision itself into the future. In a way, I was coming at this from a biodiversity angle because that city of Perth, there's 2.7 million people there now in a sprawled situation. It's going to 4.2 million by mid-century and it's smack bang in the middle of a biodiversity hotspot, right? It's one of the world's, uh, which hotspots you'll know, I, I assume, means that there is utterly unique biodiversity in that part of the world. So if you, if you lose species there, they're not coming back. They're gone. They, you can't get them from anywhere else. And there are now 34, 35 of these locations around the planet known as hotspots. 
That's where all the conservation dollars are being poured at the moment. Um, so this city lives smack bang in the middle of a hotspot, so I was approaching the future of the city's form, really, without really telling people, I was trying to restrict the sprawl balloon of that city through scenarios that would encourage alternative ways of it growing. We don't have time. There's the hotspot down in the southwest of Western Australia. That's the site, and Perth is located down there. Australia is a signatory to the Global Convention on Biodiversity. The United States is not. The United States, oddly enough, is one of the very, very few countries that is not. I don't know why that is, but the convention means, if you, are, if you sign up to it, it means that you're committing. It used to be that you committed to restoring 10% of your, a representative 10% of all of your ecozones, right? So all of the ecosystems that constitute the United States, if you sign this convention, you would be saying that you are, to honour it, you would have to get busy on reinstating a 10% sample of each of those uh, bioregions. It's now been ratcheted up to 17%, so the stakes are getting higher. And there's significant investment involved in this if you, if you take it seriously. As well as that, if you sign the convention, you are agreeing to restoring damaged landscapes by a factor of 15%. What's the difference between policy, global policy this is, and what's happening on the ground is, of course, anyone's guess. So there's a big study, there's a lot of research to be done here from where I am now at Penn in terms of ascertaining what's going on on the ground around the world, particularly in relation to these hotspots. Um, that would be the 10% fragment of, let's say you wanted to, re if Australia met its obligations and reconstructed 10% of its e ecology, but it's not much good doing it there in a block, right? You have to contribute, you have to break that up and allocate the 10% equally around the nation where you've got different ecologies. Now, one of my PhD students um, who I've been supervising for the last three years or so has been working on a national system of distributing that amount. And this is quite interesting because what we did initially was we said, OK, as a matter of policy, let's take the 10%, work it out as in square metres, square foot, feet, and distribute it evenly across the whole nation. And that gives you a 25 by 25 kilometre, say a 15 mile by 15 mile graticule of about 500 metre wide, imagine those green lines as each being 500 metres wide, of revegetation. Now that's absurd, right, to build a grid like that. That doesn't, you know, this, this, it's, it's a diagram of a policy distribution. Then you'll see the squiggly bit inside that grid, that's where we've done a lot of work at a serious design scale, adjusting the grid so that you conform to the policy, but you make the adjustments so that it picks up all the remnant vegetation and so on in that spot. So I'll just whip you through these. These are all, this is part of the process, you know, getting it organised and then connecting it beyond that particular graticule. So you eventually end up with a reconstructed landscape system. This is an agrarian landscape. Right? It's a massive food bowl, wheat farming country. But you end up with a re-threaded, reconstructed ecosystem which accords with the international convention. Now that's green infrastructure on a big scale. And that's compelling because we do, we're okay talking about infrastructure spend on a big scale in the national interest when it's ports and trains and broadband telecommunications, right? We don't, we're not yet used to talking about green infrastructure. So that's what we've been doing with that particular study, um, which leads to the final large scale project of thinking about, well, can you design a country? I mean, can you think strategically on that scale? Um, and we've, Australia is a simpler diagram than the United States to start working on it, right? Because you've, you've been able to build so much more urbanity in so many more d different parts of the United States because you had good soil as you moved west. In Australia, it's essentially a coastal fringe um, uh, development with the, the heart of the country is essentially uninhabitable, you know. So it is a simpler diagram, but it's threading technology and infrastructure over the same scale as the United States for a much thinner population. Anyway, when we looked at all the planning documents in Australia at the moment, all the planning intelligence in that country, and you add up the numbers of people they're dealing with, they only speak to five million more people. In other words, there's only an attitude, even, and even then it's barely a, um, it's not a set of 
design ideas about where people will live. It's just like, oh, we'll consolidate Todd's and we'll do a bit of infill development and we'll do 50% further suburban sprawl and that should look after things for another 5 million people. So there's, when you look at the population projections for this nation out to 2100, we kind of asked, well, where are the other 35 million people? They're just missing. So we started to model this out in time with the real numbers, as it were, and try to scope what a nation of 62 million might be. The final result is actually the image there. There's a little bright spot up in the north, which is a city called Darwin, um, which is right on the rim of the powerhouse of the Asian market. Potentially a fantastic location for a thriving city. Um, I won't talk about that tonight because it's another story, but that's one strategy to, to really to focus on that, that northern tip. The other areas of bright light that you can see, see are they are not yet mega regions. They are technically not mega regions. And they also technically don't have any mega cities, right? No cities over 10 million. But Australian cities are four, five, they're in, they're in the range of four to five million. And they're heading toward mega region status. We argued that they should have, sorry, mega city status. In other words, they're growing to 10 million. We argued that they should, st we should avoid that. You look at the livability uh, statistics for mega cities around the world, they're all poor. They all rate poorly. Like New York and London are great. We know that. Los Angeles, fantastic. If you can afford it. But they actually grind the bulk of their populations down. They're good for tourists and good for a certain elite. Um, and they're compelling for theorists and voyeurs. But our argument was avoid mega city status by decentralising population out through mega regions. So you can start to foster through infrastructure and catalyse mega regions. And the most famous mega region on the planet, of course, is the one we're in right now. Boswash, from Boston to Washington. 55 million people kind of woven into the ecosystem of the place, you know, with, with an incredible cultural richness. And I, this book became, this study became about how do you catalyse those, that sort of growth in the right places in Australia to absorb population growth in a constructive way. And it became, the answer is, a mega region down the southeast and a mega region down the southwest. It's not rocket science, but you do a lot of mapping and then, then you do a drawing, right? Or you do a scribble. To make, you do the sort of scribble in Photoshop to make it look like you're a genius and you just had the idea of designing a country. Um, this is the broadband telecommunications. There's two things you need for mega regions, right? You need high-speed telecommunications and you need high-speed tra transportation. I don't know why you're so reluctant having so many problems with high-speed rail here. It just seems like you've got to thread that thing through soon. Um, in Australia, high-speed rail works very well when it's, the distance is too big to drive and not so big that you would fly. So this drawing shows you broad, the broadband that's being rolled out in Australia as we speak woven into high-speed rail down the southeast and down the southwest, and onto that you can graft population and seed new towns. We'll skip a bit of this. There's the southeast mega region, the southwest mega region. And then, back to, I, I mentioned I would show you some heroic Macargian views, but these are not views of where the city should not go. These are views of building cities. Building small new cities on linked with broadband telecommunications and high-speed rail, which is that red line running through the image. And these are, th these are hard to do because they're, the easiest thing is to start getting excited in the machines and doing all sorts of fabulous form, right? So these, it's always hard to find that threshold with representation. You want it to be believable so a politician and the public can trust you, but not so banal that it just looks like more of the same. So we've tried to find that with these images. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, they're not that, they're kind of, I don't know, I'm not that happy with them, but they're, they're suggesting different forms of urbanism that relates to these different lands, these site specific conditions. But th this could be somewhat novel. The project of building new cities is compelling. It, you know, it's, it, it could be really exciting without being overly heroic about it. Different configurations on the coast, inland, and so on. Okay, that's, uh, this is the final, the final image, and, and, and this is where I'm going at the moment, and this scales up again. It gets back to the global issue that I was, or that thread I've been trying to run through the lecture, particularly in the early parts of the lecture. Here I've put the world, I just want to destabilise you a little bit, so I've put it into Buckminster Fuller's famous organisation, so you don't recognise necessarily where you are. 
in terms of um, national delineation. The black dots are cities. Cities of 1, 2, 5, 10 million, some 20 million. The green are the biological hotspots. The genetic diversity of the planet. 50% uh, of the genetic diversity of our plant stock on Earth and 70% of the vertebrates, the animals, is in those green areas. 34, 30, it's 34, there's talk about making a 35th down the east coast of Australia. They are the utterly... It's from those places, as Lovelock says in the quote at the bottom, that the Earth can regenerate itself. If you lose those, it's got no genetic material from which to reconstruct itself, or very little. So that's the critically valuable creative um, capacity of life on the planet. So those hotspots are receiving conservation dollars now, and the struggle is, is to shore up those places. But the, the way conservation approaches those places tends to be somewhat puritanical. You need to secure them, lock them up, and nature is, is this pure thing that we should leave alone. The reality on the ground is not that at all. These places are hybridised. The edge conditions around them, the buffer zones, is what we're starting to look at, where you get real problems with different cultural forces and political forces and land management issues. And then there might be the inner sanctum of real biodiversity that you have to lock up as best you can. But the buffers need to be dealt with. And what the red in the drawing are mega regions, right, where you do have continuous conurbations of cities and infrastructure, where you get those mega regions, and population of course, mega regions clashing with the hotspots, they're the critical points where I think as urban planners, designers and landscape architects, we could do our work best. The conservationists will look after the, you know, the really pure parts of these, these biodiversity areas. And then we've got lots of urban people working on cities, but we haven't got many people working on where these two things really intersect. And that's where the calamity, as it were, is occurring. Um, the, 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 the red box there is a city of um, three billion. I haven't distributed that on the map because <laughs> I don't know where that's going to happen. That would be ridiculous. But that's the actual scale of three billion people living in uh, suburbia. They're, they're the three billion. We're at seven billion now. We've got three more coming, right, to get to ten. Then we might stabilise. So we now have to distribute somehow that red cube through that system of hotspots, mega regions and existing cities. So it's on that scale that this drama is being played out throughout the course of the 21st century. So uh, at the top I've just put the points down that I think are really critical. The way we handle mega regions, the way they relate to food bowls, we need to get, we need to get twice the yield agriculturally out of our agricultural landscapes. We can't cut down any more forest. It's like cutting out your lungs. It stabilises the climate insofar as the, the, the climate is at all stabilised. The preservation of the hotspots, and that for me adds up to the title of the lecture, which was Global Landscape Futures, and that's the research platform that I'm building down at Penn. So, thank you very much. Uh, we, we have time for some questions, if, if I haven't gone over time. You're on. Can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> Can you talk a little about the agency uh, that your work as uh, design in design and planning has in the country of Australia? Is there a respect for the sort of work that designers do? Yep. And something happens with it? I, the, the, the question is what sort of agency does the work that I've shown you have in real terms, right? Okay, that's a really good question because that. If, if it didn't have any agency, then it's just designers making stuff for designers. And there's always a bit of that going on because we are a community that speaks to each other and develops ideas. But in the case of... Um, the short answer is yes, it does have efficacy for a couple of reasons. One is that we do visuals. Visuals are really important. It's, whereas planning is a kind of flat land of blobs of colour on maps and lots of policy, for designers to take on a planning scale of operation, suddenly, because we always had the pictures, 
the mapping, the data, but then pictures of how the of three dimensional form, both policy makers and the public got very engaged with it, just by that fact alone. Then there's a, there was a second aspect of it, which was, um, as I said earlier, working with the future is kind of safe because it hasn't happened yet. So if you, you need to know how far to go into the future, not so far that what you're doing is just kind of fantasy, but not so short-sighted that it gets bogged down in the day-to-day -day grind of a particular planning system in a place. The third thing is scenarios are good. Scenarios are good to think with. Audiences, policy makers, even mayors. And I've worked, this, my material has, I'll come back to that. It works when you open the future up to variation. People get buy-in. They feel more comfortable. About it. it's, they, if you, you can't sell the heroics of the master plan anymore. The public don't buy it. Politicians have no use for it. They're scared to commit to anything. But scenario planning at least opens up discourse. People talk and argue, and you start to get the positions shaking, shaking down. The other strategic thing is that you, which really does work, is taking a certain policy setting now and extrapolating it. So you might have a policy here. I don't know, whatever. Take any policy that's 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 written that shapes the the current urban configuration of this area or land use. Take that policy as business as usual and multiply it by by some other factor, and then you can show a kind of you can show consequences, which then and that has political efficacy because then the public go, oh, 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 we actually don't want that. We didn't realise it was going to be that. Again, that, then it's a representational issue, drawing, making images that the public can understand. Um, and so the answer, in short, is when we did this work, we were playing around in the studio because that's what we do. But as soon as this sort of work was published, the, uh, the study on the whole city of Perth and then nationally, I've had, the, I've had very senior politicians straight on the phone saying, we need to talk. Uh, which has been fun. Uh, along those lines, do, do the scenarios ever try to tap into foreseeable crises and those can be the moments that lead to decisions? I think of the, right. the dark side of how many, right. that Naomi Klein's book, uh, Shock Doc, and said Chicago School is always ready for a crisis to happen somewhere so they can come and right, right. implement. Do these almost strategically use crises, but the time of a crisis needs to well exceed whatever. Yeah. The, this, you, you, we didn't. They're called black swan events, right? We didn't. We don't. We don't work with them. Uh, I haven't. I have never done it. We could. I think it's interesting, but it tends to make the scenario modelling a bit too specific then. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned about avoiding the dystopian just as much as I am avoiding the utopian. The public have had enough of both, actually. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting question as to how you would model alternative futures that really do factor in empirically, right? You're not, you're not talking about just making up an, um, a, a crisis. You're talking about, I take it, you're talking about factoring in reliable data of a crisis situation. Like sea level rise, do you mean that kind of thing? Well, for instance, I mean, in the US they haven't done what um, they've managed to do in the Netherlands in terms of trying to manage something that's unmanageable at the sea. But right. Suddenly, after one flood, New York City thinks, well, how much money could we sh throw at the right. East River and the you know, next will then fall? And it seems to be a foreseeable crisis, but it's not when you react to the temporal event of the crisis. So that's yeah. what I'm curious about. Yeah, no, it's a good, it, it is, there's a lot of studios being run on that Sandy event, post Sandy. Um, um, and certainly, you could hang whole, you could model, you could certainly model scenarios on that basis. And that would be of use because you would get some, you would initially get some interest, I suppose. It would have some, it would cut through, right? Whereas population growth is a little bit, population growth is a good one. Um, but the drama of these sort of catastrophic events is, is potentially better, yes. Because you do have to, like, how do you unpack all of that development in all of those coastal areas given that Sandy's going to happen again? That's, it has to be modelled with, these sorts of methods on, on a large scale, right? Yes. Super lecture, thank you. Thank you. You just recently, in dealing with the mega regions, uh, offered uh, what I would call, I'm a nerd, but I would call three formal alternatives um, within the 
Right. Are, are you are you asking about what we would think would be the ideal density for a new yeah. city, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we again getting back to this idea of keeping the polemic open to an audience. We always tiptoe around the sprawl debates, right? There's a lot of a lot of there's a large contingent in the public that wants to sprawl for good reason. And if they can decentralise out of existing cities that are, that are suffering because of congestion, they will sprawl. Um, alternatively, there's, there's, there's people that are, are, are equally committed to levels of density because they associate that with all things urbane and good. Because that's such a polarised debate, we just tried to offer... We tried to illustrate the possibility of, and if you look at those images down on the down the sides, there's 50 different kinds of urbanism, and we've made it like a menu. You can select one. That's that's your problem. If you want to start getting engaged in a, doing a new pot of settlement, you guys can work out whether you want to live at a Manhattan density or you know um, a Broadacre city density or a Garden city density or suburban density. Um, there's room for all of it, I would have thought. So I'm not giving you an answer on what I think is the ideal density for a city. Yes? I just um, wanted to thank you for sharing your work. Thank you. Um, but I wanted to ask a question with your experience on a worldwide global basis. How unique is the, the, the seemingly uh, disconnected U.S. planning paradigm basically a new frontier, everybody has a little house on the prairie, with what your work implies as an answer to biodiverse planning, in other words, primary fibers of water and transportation being planned first. But how do you see the United States' unique political situation? If you can, speak to that. Are we that unique and therefore problematic or not? Oh, I wish I could answer your question. I've only been here for two months. <laughs> but if, it's, if the market rules, right, is that what you... If, does it? Is it is it laissez-faire out there? The market rules. I don't know. I don't know the planning system, but uh, but in Australia certainly, we now have an interest in federally coordinated strategic planning, Be because we know we need that. We know that we're not going to be competitive, so we're we're not prepared to sacrifice individual liberty to that necessarily, or state liberty, right? But the, so the federal government is, for the first time, coming in over the top and saying, OK, this is serious. We need national green infrastructure, national telecommunications infrastructure, national housing infrastructure, and so on. So there is a... And, and they've set up organisations to actually study and prosecute that large-scale coordinated planning. If you don't have that here, then I would have thought you probably need it. How, how the planning system works here, I, I would like to know how that, how it works. Just as a follow up, I mean, you're the evolution, your work of uh, European and British Commonwealth planning strategies, right. so a social kind of pattern. And of course, we broke away from that. Now, home rule governs here. Home rules is like an Onondaga County. We have 30 or 43 municipalities just in this county. Uh -huh. And that we have many counties throughout the state. So the complexity of getting comprehensiveness through that. Duane tried to do it when he was here, had a good plan. Uh, but the inertia is to change it in a larger way where we can apply the concepts you're speaking to. That's the dilemma we see. Yeah, when you fly over, what you see, you can see the results of that too. It's incredibly eclectic. It's sprawl. It's all sprawl scape, but it's really eclectic. It looks like lots of different typologies, and it's, it's very interesting. 
But if the, the, the binding thread might be, as this century unfolds, the binding thread might be landscape, you see. It can kind of... Dwayne will never get up because he's, he's, he's selling such a particular view of the world. It's such a bourgeois, aesthetically loaded... Um, it's not dealing with the whole landscape. It's dealing with just townscape in, a, in residential areas, right? Which is, when you fly over North America, the residential is part of it, but it's just one part of the, 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 the complexity of cities. It's too prescriptive. Um, but ecology and an environmental landscape architectural perspective of place is just about trying to lock in systems that are healthy, which underpins the health of a given community. Um, I would have thought that would receive buy-in from lots of diverse communities and, and would then need political sanctioning at a higher political level. We're going... Yeah, okay. Thank you.